started. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today. Welcome to CNCF, or welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Encrypting Data in Kubernetes Deployments. Protect your data, not just your secrets. I'm Christy Chan, Marketing Communications Manager at CNCF. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Maxim Yankovsky, VP of Engineering at ZSX. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. With that, I'll hand it over to Maxim to, to kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, good morning, good day, and welcome everybody. Um, as they say in the airline business, when you board a plane, you know, we, we realize you have a lot of choices when it comes how do you spend the next hour of your time. Actually, with the quarantine today, you don't have a lot of choices, but we're still gonna try and make this hour very educational and very informative. Um, so with that, I'm Maxim Jankowski. I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Zetaset. Um, brief bio of myself is uh, I've been working with uh, data security and encryption software for the past um, over 14 years uh, in companies such as Ingrian Networks and SafeNet, and my team has been responsible for developing uh, cutting edge security solutions, um, including the uh, key secure uh, data security appliances that are still being successfully sold um, and uh, shipped to customers uh, as part of SafeNet, Jamalto, and now Talos security portfolio. And at Zetaset, we're developing um, encryption and security software that is being used in today's ever-changing marketplace. Uh, a brief agenda of what we're going to do today, it, this is not linear, it's kind of a summary of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about global security challenges, the state of encryption, where we came from, how we ended up here, and what it looks like now. Um, we're going to talk about data breaches, data protections, um, in terms of DevOps and DevSecOps. Um, we're going to talk about what it would take to, uh, to engineer an application or an application system with security in mind. Um, and of course, true to the topic of today's webinar, we're going to talk about how do we protect enterprise data. And then we'll have enough time to go into a Q&A, of course. So first item on the menu, data breaches. Um, the cyber attacks are increasing in frequency. Uh, everybody has been targeted. Um, you'll see a number of companies mentioned in a small font down there. On this, at the bottom of the slide, uh, but there's some big names there. Equifax, Verizon, just to name a few, Whole Foods, um, IRS, Blue Cross, you, you look across the companies and you realize every single sector has been hacked. And um, essentially, data breaches are a dime a dozen. They happen very often. But in terms of the cost of the breach, they're actually quite pricey to the enterprises. They're about 3.62 um, million per breach and the breaches happen often. And if you look at it, um, over 42% or around 42% of the cost of the data breach is actually the cost that enterprises incur in the lost business. That's quite substantial. So nobody's gonna be surprised when the ne next data breach occurs. Um, what remains to be seen is that what enterprises are going to be doing to prevent these data breaches from happening. And again, true to today's presentation, we're going to talk about containers. We're going to talk about containers in production. Um, containers is a rel rel relatively new technology. Uh, it's been on a rapid adoption scale you know, over the past several years. Um, and several things that um, these graphs that you see on the screen show is that the use of containers have been increasing um, pretty dramatically, and the containers uh, use in production has also been increasing. Um, on the second graph especially, if you look at the number of um, containers that people run in production, um, you'll notice a drop in the number of containers used in production of uh, clusters 50 and less and fewer containers. At the same time, you'll notice the increase of the number of 
uh, containers in a larger clusters. So what that indicates is that a lot of containers are, you know, people moving from kicking the tires and uh, moving containers into production. So with the number of clusters and number of um, containers in production increasing, the number of attacks are obviously increasing, and consequently the importance of um, protecting from those attacks increases as well. So some of the surveys indicate that 69% uh, of those surveyed, they uh, intend to store sensitive data in containers. And around 76% um, use containers for storing and manipulating data that fall under some sort of regulations. And the staggering number, that's 94% uh, of those surveyed experienced one or more security incident in the past 12 months. And I think the other 6% are just not saying. Um, so what are the challenges? You know, why, you know, data protection is such an important topic. Um, in fact, data protection and data security is a super important topic when you talk to enterprises regarding their storage challenges, and also it's in the top three of the security challenges um, with, you know, protecting the data in containers, uh, along with vulnerability uh, management and uh, runtime protection. So in a CNCF survey conducted in 2019, uh, the survey indicates quite a good uh, uptick in uh, respondents using Kubernetes in production uh, from somewhere in 2018 up to 2019, about 20% uptick in the uh, number of containers that are being used in production. And users are certainly expecting more security with their deployments and compliance, 68% uh, of those surveys indicate that compliance is critical uh, and, and a must have. And those who indicate that it's a nice to have are probably those moving into larger scale deployments and also moving more containers to production. So I fully expect the numbers of this 28% spill into the 68% and that number increase as well. So these few slides, if they show a few, you know, if there are a few takeaways from these slides is that uh, containers are on the upswing, container environments are becoming more and more prevalent, regulated enterprises are moving data into containerized environments, and they're increasing the sizes of those environments. And um, storage and data security and compliance are becoming one of the several major factors um, on the road of uh, successful container deployments. So how do you protect your data in general, not just in container environments? Uh, encryption is, I would say, the best form of data protection. And encryption, by the way, encryption in and of itself is not the end all data protection for your enterprise environment. Data protection is usually a combination of tools, but we like to call encryption kind of the last line of defense. After your, file, your firewall is compromised and your environments are broken in, the next thing you have is the safe, kind of the safe in your living room that stores your most valuable information. Uh, so you have to encrypt throughout the process. You have to start a collection. You have to um, encrypt all data manipulation pipelines, and preferably you do that at the time when the data is created. Any sensitive information might, must be stored, uh, that must be stored, must be encrypted. And of course, you have to uh, log and monitor all data activity, because oftentimes log mining is one of these tools that gives you a visibility and early visibility into a data breach. So encryption is super important. Data protection is super important. So why aren't more people deploying it? Why aren't why is it not the norm? And this is where we talk a little bit about you know what encryption was and what it is now. Uh, encryption used to be quite complex to deploy and to manage. Uh, it used to impact performance to a substantial amount of degree. Um, there's a lot of um, crypto accelerators and a lot of specialized hardware that have been built over the years to uh, address performance concerns. Um, 
And if you look at those uh, surveyed back in 2017, they clearly indicate that 78% are concerned about deploying encryption because it's going to impact um, the system performance and latency, and the enterprises just cannot slow, slow their applications down. Uh, also, encryption, at least used to be, and some of the current encryption solutions still are, um, not simple to manage. Uh, you have to identify which data you want to encrypt, and then you have to manage the encryption solution. You cannot just point and encrypt, and you should be able to. Um, enforcement of policy is one of the other um, is, is another chief you know, hurdle to uh, adopt encryption. And of course, with increased cloud and on-premise and hybrid deployments, uh, it's concerning for people how well encryption is supported in those hybrid deployments. Uh, of course, with the rise of cloud and virtualized environment systems, scalability becomes a problem. We used to just deploy an encryption server in the data center and call it a day, but now uh, we may not even have access to the data center. And the uh, number of environments is increasing, number of containers is increasing, and therefore, obviously, the number of uh, cryptographic keys that are used to protect those environments is increasing. Uh, one of the surveys we don't show here indicates that over 40% of enterprises are not using key management tools, any key management tools, and actually storing um, encryption keys in the combination of uh, text files and spreadsheets, which, you know, it that does not really sound like a 21st century security practice or as a security practice in general. And of course, one of the other concerns is integration with other security tools because large enterprises, they have a combination of um, solutions and combination of tools and encryption needs to integrate with those. So it's not easy. Integration, integrating encryption has not been easy and it's still not. Um, so when your enterprise is at a point where it has to either comply with the regulation or um, it's just doing kind of a good uh, housekeeping of protecting their customers' data uh, and your task um, or one of your colleagues is tasked with choosing an encryption solution, what is that that you look for? What is it mean to have a good encryption solution in your enterprise. Uh, as we already talked, uh, performance is super critical. So you want a solution that introduces performance penalty, but in, in a very small uh, percentage numbers. Uh, encryption is not free, even with today's crypto accelerators and native encryption support uh, in Intel chips, encryption still costs performance cycles, but you want to keep that to the minimum. Uh, businesses, they don't want to have any impact on their existing processes. Um, if you talk to some of the, especially healthcare uh, providers, they cannot have, uh, they cannot be adding even a minute to a um, patient appointment uh, because their practice essentially runs on seconds. Uh, scalability of physical environments, virtual environments, hybrid environments, um, the environments come and go, they get deployed several times a day, they get decommissioned several times a day. And of course, you cannot have, you know, a person run to a data center and install a security appliance every time a new environment comes on board. So back in, I can't really say back in my day, but back in, uh, you know, late 20th century and even early 21st century, um, enterprises had to have de dedicated people um, on their staff that understood what, how encryption works, um, how encryption is deployed, what's an encryption key, what's a key wrapping key, uh, what's a hash key, what type of algorithms are recommended, what types are not, and you know, what, after you deploy, how do you manage and troubleshoot that system? And it's pretty difficult and pretty expensive. And so anything we can do, anything encryption solutions can do to make it simpler to manage and simpler to deploy, um, and anything these solutions can do uh, to make sure that you don't need uh, spe specialized cryptographic expertise, um, that makes a better solution. And of course, there's a number of compliance initiatives going around since um, the first data breaches back in early 2000 um, that compromised the financial sector pretty severely. Um, that's where MasterCard uh, came up and, and Visa came up with the PCI or payment card industry standards. Um, 
And so all of these compliance initiatives around PCI, around financial sector, around uh, healthcare sector that later resulted in HIPAA regulations and, and so on and so forth. One of the notable one being uh, GDPR uh, as of the past few years. Um, all of those compliance initiatives, uh, they are, encryption is a very good vehicle to address chief concerns of those, com uh, of those compliance initiatives and essentially pass the compliance audits. So one thing I'd like to put to rest right at the beginning or right at the beginning of a more technical part of this presentation is um, there have been tools that have been created over the years that attempt to simplify or make it simpler to deploy encryption and to manage encryption. And some of them are self-encryption drives, some of them are file encryption solutions and, and, and so on and so forth. And so why would we just not use them? So on the left of the slide, you can see a uh, what I would call the encryption stack, which is essentially a software stack with, and hardware stack where you can apply encryption. Starting from the hardware, you can go all the way to application level encryption. The interesting thing about the stack is that as you go higher up the stack, you're talking about more purpose-built solutions and you're talking about greater performance degradation. As you go lower up the stack, you're talking about more generalized solutions. And, um, you're talking about better performance, but oftentimes you have to sacrifice some granularity, especially in databases and applications where you might not be encrypt, you might not be able to encrypt a column in the database, you might have to encrypt the entire table. Uh, or you might not be able to encrypt the entire table, you'll have to encrypt an entire partition that the database stores files on. So the goal of this slide is to show that there needs to be a compromise between performance and granularity. And um, self-encryption drives are very low on the stack, very appealing, but they're not a compromise. Uh, we're gonna talk about what does it take to make a good encryption solution that you can trust with protecting your data. Uh, to make it short on this slide, I'm just gonna say that self-encryption drives are certainly not gonna help uh, make you a good um, encryption solution because not only their key management is borderline non-existent, or if it does exist, it's very much substandard, uh, also, how do you manage a data center of 10,000 self-encrypting drives uh, when you need to replace or manage those installations? And finally, if you're in the cloud environment, do you really have a choice as to whether or not self-encrypted drives are used, how often they're decommissioned, and how often they're replaced? So not the answer. And with that, we're going to talk about DevOps, DevSecOps, and why do we need to put security in place at the design time and why security is an afterthought is a very, very bad idea. Um, so DevOps is essentially an ability to deliver quality applications, quality software fast. And DevSecOps is ability to do this with security in mind. So not only you're del delivering quality applications you are, and you're doing it fast and predictable on a fast and predictable schedule, you're also developing secure applications quickly that enterprises can trust to store their sensitive data. Um, so security should be baked in from the very beginning. You need to identify your primary drivers for your security initiatives. Is that compliance? Is that a good housekeeping? Is that you know the desire to protect customers' data? Usually it's a combination of both, or uh, at least hopefully it's a combination of both. And so how do you balance security with regulatory compliance. And the reason I bring this up explicitly is because regulatory compliance is usually done on a timeline uh, and enterprises oftentimes attempt to achieve compliance with the least amount of invest investment in security initiatives. So there, there is a fine line, there is a balance that you have to figure out between how do you make environment more secure and also achieve compliance you have to look at what security solutions are appropriate for your environments, not just today, but going forward as well. And tempting as it may be to just say, you know, environments come with secrets and passwords and all different kinds of ways to store your sensitive data. Uh, and secrets and passwords are great. They're very important. They're critical to environment functionality, but they protect your processes. They do not protect your data. Um, so, a good security solution is, the good, is a security solution that you can trust. 
Because if you can't trust your security solution, then, then why bother deploying it in the first place? Um, security solution, as we talked, is a combination of components. And all those components talk to each other. They have to be able to trust each other. That is why pretty much every security solution needs to have one or another form of what's called the certificate authority, which is, think of it as a, um, you know, United States Department of State that issues passports to security services or DMV that issues driver licenses. It's essentially a service that authentica authenticates security processes and other processes to one another. So when you talk to a process on a system, you can trust it. Um, my favorite analogy is that, you know, you encrypt your environment, you have one or more encryption key, and so where do you put your encryption keys? You need to have a key manager a system that is capable of securely and safely storing those keys. I mean, you wouldn't put your house key under a doormat. I mean, some, some of us do. Some of us put it in the wheel well and, you know, we hide it creatively and we're surprised when we're broken into. Um, so no keys under the doormat. And there's a number of key managers that are available in the market with different, um, depending on your security requirements, you can opt for software-based key managers. You can opt for uh, hardware-based key managers, that's up to you, but when you look at a security solution and it doesn't make a specific mentioning of how it stores and protects your keys, I say look somewhere else. And of course, there should be a root of trust. And when I say root of trust, I mean the root of trust for storing what's called the master key. Essentially, your key manager protects your most valuable assets is, is the encryption keys. Uh, so who protects your key manager? Uh, and for that, there's a special um, component in security solutions that's called the security module. And uh, there are a number of security modules which are hardware-based, and there are a number of security modules which are software-based, but that's kind of a given that if you have a key manager, it needs to have a specific security module component so that the encryption da uh, key database is protected and encrypted itself with the security module, uh, with the keys stored in the security module. And the security module knows how to store the small number of uh, master keys and stores in a secure and compliant way. So containerized environments, they're quite different. They look, for, for when you're within the container, you can't really say necessarily that you're within the container because the containerized and virtualization environments, they do a pretty good job of hiding the fact that you're within a small container uh, from developer or from the end user. But containerized environments are very, very different. So um, storage in containers is different, and therefore the data, and especially the sensitive data, must be protective, uh, protected in different ways. Uh, the first one, the first key point is that encryption must follow storage, which means in multi-tenant uh, container environments, the storage will be shared. Um, but even if you share the storage, you should never share an encryption key. I mean, to me, it's, and then to a lot of people, you know, if I say it slightly different, is that you better trust the people you give uh, your house keys to, right? That's kind of obvious. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised why, you know, not sharing an encryption key is not so obvious, but, but apparently it's not. Um, storage must be independent of hosting containers, meaning Today your container might run on one host, tomorrow it might run on another host. That actually means that you know, the storage must be shared between containers. So we cannot use legacy approach of hardware-defined storage uh, where the storage is directly and physically tied to the host. We cannot use that approach uh, when managing storage for containers. And last but not least, and also super critical, is the separation of duties. Uh, we have different roles and different actors now. We have developers. We have platform operators, we have administrators, we have a number of other roles, but there needs to be a clear separation of duties. And not that you shouldn't trust your developers, but the developers are not in the best position. They're not the best people to ask uh, to make security decisions. These decisions have to be made elsewhere in the enterprise, and you want to maintain that separation of duties. So let's look at an example of a uh, topology that you may see in a typical, uh, maybe even simpler Docker environments where you have one or more Docker hosts and each host runs one or more containers. Containers are 
obviously belong to different applications. That's the whole purpose of virtualization is, is uh, sharing resources between containers and sharing resources between tenants. So you can have different um, Docker hosts running different containers for different applications belonging to different customers. The key point is, is um, the storage and the containers. Every storage unit associated with every container must be encrypted with its own unique key. Why is that so important? Because compromises happen. We talked at the beginning of the presentation that environments will be compromised. Uh, when the environment is compromised, you want to limit the exposure. You don't want one of your environments, uh, if somebody compromises my development environment, I don't want that exposure to spill out to my payroll environment or my finance environment. Um, if I am a solution provider and if I host more than one customer, I certainly don't want one compromised customer to compromise my entire multi-tenant environment. So that is why no sharing of keys. So how would we, you know, how would you do this? How would we accomplish that? Let's say with with Docker, um, we would look at Docker storage mechanisms, and we would create a um, what's called an encryption volume driver. Uh, so at the time that the container requests storage, uh, it would be given a storage volume that is already encrypted. Uh, it would be encrypted with its own key that is not used for any other storage um, volume anywhere else. And the key will be securely stored in the key manager with all the certificate authority and then security module infrastructure we already talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, this is done by directly integrating with um, encrypted volume driver that is part of Docker. And we are going to um, have some sort of volume provisioning and some sort of volume management. What we show here is a very simplified, very simplistic uh, volume provisioning based on um, a traditional Linux storage model. But the volume group provisioning might as well look at provisioning specific uh, cloud-based storage in AWS or in Google Cloud. Uh, the most important part is that by the time container gets the volume, the volume is already encrypted. So let's look at a more fluid environment uh, where Kubernetes makes it easy to orchestrate a very large number of containers. And um, Kubernetes has a number of worker nodes similar to Docker nodes, but now uh, containers can run pretty much anywhere. In Docker world, at least there's some association between where container ran today and where the container will run when it's restarted tomorrow. A container can be scheduled on one node and rescheduled on another node at a different time, depending on the environment load. That's, that's the uh, Kubernetes way of running containers. Uh, the storage is most likely shared. The same storage paradigm is that every storage unit associated with every container has to be encrypted with its own unique key. And uh, notice we specifically emphasize that on the Kubernetes master level, we have secrets. And uh, the secrets, as we all know, stores in uh, etcd uh, key value pairs. Uh, up until the latest uh, revisions of Kubernetes, uh, etcd was not encrypted. Now there is an option to encrypt it. But an important part to realize is that secrets, just like I said at the beginning, is kind of like a password file. It is critical, absolutely. To Java developers, secrets are kind of like JKS key store. So what do we store in the key store? We store keys, we store passwords, we store certificates, and so on and so forth. But we don't use um, the key store, and we don't use secrets to store encrypted data. And so the same approach um, would be beneficial to that type of environment is you'd see a Kubernetes code uh, lay out a volume claim um, for a particular storage unit or a storage class, as we would call it in Kubernetes. And that storage class would hopefully refer to an encrypted volume driver that, just like uh, a specialized volume drivers know how to provision NFS storage or uh, AWS storage or any other type of storage, an encrypted volume driver would know how to provision an encrypted volume um, on request. An important thing to note is that every pod will get its own separate and distinct uh, volume. Uh, and every volume 
will get its own separate and distinct encryption key and its own separate and distinct backend storage. So um, that backend storage will be transparently provisioned in the encrypted state by the encrypted CSI driver. Um, so this type of approach, it lends itself very, very well for enterprise use cases where, uh, again, as we talked earlier, encryption is not the one to solve every data protection problem. Uh, a big problem of data protection is can you trust your, uh, can you trust your environment? And so in the example of, uh, of uh, Red Hat OpenShift, uh, where they provide an infrastructure and framework for essentially certifying uh, containers and uh, Kubernetes operators, um, that gives you a certain level of, a certain additional level of assurance and security that whenever something develop, someone develops and certifies a solution, um, it is going through a certain certification process that assures that container images are built on top of a trusted platform, that uh, you can trust the container image, you can trust the deployment mechanism, um, you can trust all of the components that run within the uh, certified environment, and you get all of those images, all of the container images, all of the operator images, everything basically related to any software, including encryption software. When you get it, you get it from a trusted source. So we talked about different places and different levels at which we can apply encryption. And uh, what are some of the advantages of implementing encryption in a way that's native to containers? Uh, we already talked about unique key per volume. So each persistent volume is encrypted with its own cryptographic key. So one uh, compromised container does not compromise the entire multi-tenant environment. We talked about secrets are not protected by default, although they can be now protected with later, uh, later Kubernetes releases but the important notion is that they do not protect the data. So a separate data protection solution is required. As we talked, at, uh, as we talked uh, earlier, uh, password files don't protect data, they protect your environments. And JKSs don't protect your data, they protect your environment. So every Unix system has a password file, but that doesn't mean that every Unix system doesn't have a separate encryption and security solution that it comes with. Um, one, huge, very large benefit of um, native container encryption is that you can securely, with a proper key management infrastructure, you can securely erase the data without actually having to erase the data. And that is done by um, decommissioning the cryptographic key in the key manager. And so therefore, when the container goes away, and if the container was to come up again, it won't be able to acquire an encryption key necessary to decrypt the data. Um, so as the number of nodes in the cluster grows, sometimes the nodes get compromised, sometimes nodes need to be decommissioned and replaced, and if these nodes have sensitive data, you don't always have an ability uh, to connect to a node and delete the uh, sensitive data. With the secure node removal feature, uh, you can actually do that by executing an administrative command, so then even if the node is compromised or if the, even if the node is later brought up and connected to its native network, the corporate network, uh, it will not be able to access the data. That's, again, done by um, managing what's called the certificate revocation lists in the key manager. And last but not least is the container storage separation. We already talked about why it's important to um, encrypt each container volume with its own unique key. So um, the container storage separation allows you to go even deeper on that where every container volume is mapped to um, a unique logical volume and that logical volume is only available when it's in use by one or more containers. So these are the things that you wanna look for in a software-based security solution, in any security solution you choose to deploy. And uh, hopefully with proper deployment mechanisms and with proper identifying of uh, solutions, you'll be able to deploy a solution in your enterprise that will protect your data. It'll protect your enterprise from breaches and it will protect your enterprise and hope uh, that it stays in compliance. That's, I think that covers um, 
that covers the entire presentation for today. And let me see if there are any questions. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Maxim, for a great presentation. Um, a reminder to folks that we do have a Q&A box at the bottom of uh, your screen. So if you do have a question for Maxim, feel free to drop it in. And it looks like we do have one question. I'll read it aloud for you, Maxim. Um, it's from Miguel. It says, about encryption storage, my first concern is reliability. If we lost damage some bytes on storages, we can still recover the disks or most part of the contents. From my experience, this is also a problem even in my laptop with BitLocker. How is it solved on containers? Okay, very good question. And yes, encryption is essentially an additional process in the turn on the data. So it does put a heavier load, heavier load on storage. So it's, it's a very valid concern as to how do we recover from um, lost or damaged or even worn out bytes on storage, if, especially if you look at things like S, uh, the, uh, um, if you look at the, uh, some of the more recent developments in the storage methodologies um, and you look at solid state drives, they are known for their wear. Um, so how do we do this? You deploy a proper storage mechanisms that uh, provide you a, a certain level of redundancy. You uh, back up your storage regularly and you use specialized backup, um, not just the RAID, not just uh, highly available uh, disk volumes, you're also uh, backing up the data regularly. Uh, when you deploy encryption, one of the critical portions of your data pipeline become your encryption key. So therefore, one thing you look for in a security solution is what kind of key manager infrastructure they provide. They provide key manager, great, that's already puts them ahead of many security solutions. Is that key manager highly available? Is it hosting the data or is it storing the data on highly available storage volumes? Because that's essentially what you want to do is to make sure that not only your data is protected, but your keys are also protected. Okay, awesome. It looks like we have another question. It says, uh, from an anonymous attendee, can you elaborate on what you mean by transitioning my DevOps environment to DevSecOps? Right, so this is essentially, good. again, good question. It's essentially, um, how do you take your environment where the goal of the environment is to quickly deliver quality solutions to an environment where encryption and security, rather, um, is part of that quality differentiator. So you'd like to not just say, I'm in DevOps, which is kind of like agile, uh, quickly develop solutions that have a certain level of quality. Also, security becomes uh, the implicit part of quality. That, that's the transition from DevOps to DevSecOps. Great. And there's okay, one more question. Yeah, yeah I'll read ahead. it. And I'm apologizing if I'm butchering this name, but it looks like Saruba um, is asking, could you please elaborate on secrets are not protected by default? Right. Uh, so Kubernetes secrets are not protected by default. Uh, secrets are essentially stored in um, etcd, um, which is part of the core um, Kubernetes deployment. etcd is a key value pair storage, and uh, the storage that's used by etcd to, to store the key value pairs, it's not encrypted by default. So if, you, um, if, if your etcd is compromised, then the storage is exposed and the secrets are exposed. Later versions of Kubernetes provide a way uh, for you to uh, encrypt the secret store. And that adds a certain level of protection, at least when you look at the secrets, you will not be able to gain access to the underlying secret values. Great. All right. Well, I think that um, covers all the questions today. Uh, thanks again, Maxim, for a great presentation. That's all the time that we have for today. Um, just a reminder that the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. Uh, thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you all at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day.